Welcome to another episode of Fresh Brewed Politics. I am your host, Andrew. And let's go into some updates for the news and, and go into it. So as some of you saw maybe on our one post that um, Judge uh, Bergman with his ruling, and I had mentioned this when he made the ruling, that there were some greater ramifications for that ruling. And one of the ramifications for that ruling is the fact that um, – Anybody, any business that has an HB1 plan, like we do here in Kentucky, an HB1 bill, uh, can can no longer be enforced against. That's the way the ruling's read. Well, ABC was asked, uh, in our case, was asked if they are going to continue this. They said they didn't believe the ruling said that. We asked for a clarification on the Well, we didn't. Sorry. Chris Weiss had asked for a clarification on that ruling. Upon getting the clarification that made it clear, it applied to the entire state, not just Boone County, and that these mandates are unconstitutional and continued enforcement upon people that were following the current letter of the law, which is HB1, uh, that they couldn't do that. So uh, technically speaking, if ABC continues on down this path, um, they can be held in contempt of court. Well, upon realizing that and upon uh, us um, letting them know what was up, uh, in, in a couple cases, um, the the governor decided it was now worthwhile to appeal this case. At first, he's just trying to ignore the Boone County case because he didn't want to draw attention to its ruling because its ruling literally said that masks don't work, that the governor's rulings after, um, especially after they passed new laws, uh, were no longer valid, uh, and that he was acting in an unconstitutional matter. And the media wasn't really heavily reporting on that, but it matters a whole lot as it turns out, as we're seeing with what we're seeing in the, um, with what we're seeing uh, playing out in the courts in a lot of cases. So they've decided he's going to try to appeal that. So that's in the appeals court. So what can happen is a lot of things. The Supreme Court, this most likely Supreme Court will just come in and take jurisdiction over the case, and it won't be heard by the appeal court for a new ruling. Ruling. They can, they can um, put a hold on his injunction. However, that would be an interesting situation because what we have, this case is different than most because it's not just a provisional ruling involving a couple of things. It involves evidentiary findings of the facts regarding the actual science behind COVID. And that makes it a whole different legal animal. And to just vacate something when you have the scientific findings involved uh, gets, gets a lot difficult. And then also, too, the Supreme Court of Kentucky has to ask itself, is it going to continue to be this hugely political animal? I mean, that is the precedent the Supreme Court of Kentucky is, set, is setting, that they can be used for political reasons. So are they going to put their foot down here? Because for, for those who follow the law, know the law, know that vacating this kind of order out of Judge Bergman and vacating this kind of ruling is a whole new level of being getting involved politically and, and allowing people to use the court. So he, he decided it was worthwhile to go ahead and uh, appeal that today. Uh, we'll see if that appeal is granted. But as of now, everything's still in place from that Judge Bergman's uh, ruling. So as well, as you guys notice, we're doing an email campaign with uh, the GE Appliance Park. Let me be clear. The GE Appliance Park is called GE still, but it's actually owned by Harrier, not by the original company GE, but it still goes by GE. So we're just going to call it GE Appliance Park because that's what it is. The GE Appliance Park has adopted a... a um, policy that we're seeing a lot of businesses adopt that doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and that is they're, they're adopting a physical marking policy to mark vaccinated and unvaccinated employees for masking reasons. Now, there's, there's a lot of reasons why this doesn't make sense. First, I, I know this isn't heavily talked about, but there's a big deal going on with COVID when it was discovered that it doesn't spread by droplets, but by aerosols. Because the minute you say COVID spreads by aerosols, what you're saying is masks don't work because masks block droplets. They don't block aerosols. This is what was found in the in the hearing in Boone County Court. And actually, if you go back and listen to our ABC hearing where the state, the Kentucky State Epidemiologist 3 was called up, she herself was questioned on this matter and said, hey, you know, um, what what does this mean? What does it matter? Uh, and everything else. And she herself said that at the time she was talking about at the time we thought it spread by droplets of mass matter. What's that mean? It means now because it spreads by aerosols, masks don't make a lot of sense. Additionally, as well, keep in mind that the state here has decided to drop 
the entire policy of wearing masks, regardless of your vaccination status. So what we have across Kentucky, because I know we have more than just GE doing it. We've got GE doing it. We've got, I know Buffalo Trace is doing it. Um, I know there's, there's, um, I've, I've been told like, um, I think Honeywell's doing it. A lot of these companies are doing this vax or mask process idea, even though the state itself isn't mandating it. So what we're really seeing is businesses that are not in the business of science deciding that either A, they know best because they're mandating past what the government requires. So they themselves now are putting themselves in a position to be the experts on how they're going to go ahead and uh, look at the, the science or, um, and they're also going a lot farther than what the state's mandating them to. Now, why do businesses do these things? Businesses do these things because they think it is, um, um, they're worried about making a profit, okay? And, and this is why I describe to people. Now, a lot of people out there want to say it's a HIPAA violation. Listen, go back and listen to my podcast. I've done with Chris Weiss on this. It's not a HIPAA violation. HIPAA laws only apply to medical providers. It does not apply to your employers, also, as well, think critically for a second as you're thinking, can employers do this or not? I mean, I know that if you're going to work in child care, you have to go get a TP test, right? This is, this is set up. This has happened over time. And the real problem we're running into with the COVID vaccine situation here is never before have we had a vaccine made so quickly, rolled out so quickly, offered so quickly that even as we're seeing with the heart inflammation issues, does have some unknown side effects that can cause some issues. For example, I myself, I'm under 30 years old. I have um, I had a historic uh, issues with a heart murmur growing up, um, which you know can lead me to be uh, more at risk from heart inflammation. And at the rate it is occurring, uh, I, I might have uh, looking at the data. It initially looks like because I fall in that specific age risk group, I might have a greater risk from the vaccine than I do from COVID. So if I don't want to take the vaccine because I'm taking on that risk, um, that should be between me and the private. And and really the science doesn't support the idea of masking. And I think that's the idea here. The science doesn't support it. The mandates don't support it. So you have companies that are deciding on their own to interpret whatever old defunct now science because COVID spreads by aerosols to determine what it is. And they're doing this because they think it's the best thing. They think their customers want this. It's the same reason why you see all these companies change their logos to, um, the rainbows during during Pride, or we saw during the Black Lives Ladder increase movement, we saw these random beverage company, Coca-Cola, for example, and things like that. And, and, and they send their things to less whiteness schools. It is not because they actually believe in any of these things. They don't care. Coca-Cola does not, the CEO of Coca-Cola does not, unless they are themselves LGBTQ, does not have strong feelings over LGBTQ issues. One way or another, they probably just literally think everybody should be left alone. I, I don't understand why it's such an issue, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, this one month out of the year, we change our, our, our logo to a rainbow to celebrate who you're, who people are, are enjoying their time with, which, you know, I, I would rather get to a place in this country, in this world where who you enjoy your time with doesn't matter so much that you don't need a month to celebrate it. Um, because I don't, I don't, I think it shouldn't matter that much. Like, who you go home with at night should not matter one iota to me in any way, shape, or form. And and I think that this, that goes, we'll talk about that here in a second, maybe going into some of these beliefs there as we talk about this um, BR-119 bill here in a second. But um, the point is, is these companies, they don't actually believe these things. What are they doing? Why are they doing this? They're doing it because they believe it is the most most profitable option for them. They either believe that uh, if they show good COVID practices, the state won't come shut them down. They believe that more of their, if they show they're being, quote unquote, what they think is responsible, they won't come shut them down, things like that. But here's the fact of the matter. Masking and vaccination status has become slightly political tool. The science is clearly not supporting this idea that if you've been vaccinated, you're at a high risk from people who haven't been vaccinated, not wearing masks, because if it was a high risk situation, wouldn't they keep mandating it and all these states? But no, the CDC doesn't even suggest it anymore. It's not even CDC guidelines anymore because the science behind it doesn't make sense. It never made sense, but it certainly doesn't make sense now.
So instead, you have these companies engaging what is essentially political behavior. And keep in mind, guys, these once again, these are what they do for Pride Month. This is what they've done in the Black Lives Matter movement. They're engaging in political behaviors. And in this specific case, it's one thing for Coke to change their logo to a rainbow or to put out what is essentially uh, a B, you know, Marxist BLM belief statements or, or whatever they want to say. Right? That if they want to say that, that is on them. That doesn't affect the person on the line. But what, whether we like it or not, masking has become a marker of your politics, not just to the right, but to the left as well. And it became a marker because of Donald Trump and not because Donald Trump made it a marker, but because the media and the left hated him so much that masking became the, the left's version of a MAGA hat. Right. It became the less versions of a MAGA hat. And, and this is obvious when you do polling about they were doing some polling about masking and people on the left and and Democrats and stuff. And their biggest reason for still wearing a mask was because they didn't want to be confused as being a down and dirty Republican. So it's clear that if that's the biggest reason why people are still wearing masks are still wearing masks because they want to make sure people don't think they're Republicans. This is a political thing. And these are businesses getting involved in politics. So we've got a lot of reasons behind it. One, the science don't make sense. Two, you're coercing people to make a decision that is medically between them, and it's a very kind of private decision. As I said, I have my own reasons for not getting vaccinated. People have their own reasons for getting vaccinated, and that's okay. That is their private decisions to make, and there shouldn't be any coercion when it comes to your medical history. I mean, I mean, I can't think of another time it's been medically acceptable to coerce people into doing things that we think we're just like, oh, you should do that. You know, like it, it's strange to me. It's strange. Um, and then three, you know, this whole entire thing's become a political marker and it makes a divisive situation. We will, if, if you really want to bring us together as a community, you want to leave politics out, you want to do everything else. You can't be doing these divisive type behaviors that whether it's 30% or 80% don't agree with it. You can't be doing it. You can't be doing it. And so it's just not their place. So what we've done, and I want to invite you guys to join us in doing it. We're going to post some more about it, but we posted it, uh, I think like what, two days ago now, Nick, was it two days ago? I think it was two days ago. Um, I th we posted it two days ago. And uh, so far we had gotten in right around about, uh, I believe, over over 300 emails have been sent over to them over 300 emails um pretty close to 300 okay so th pretty close to 300 emails have been sent over to them and so um we've got the link for you guys uh it is it is freedomfight.us slash um i don't know it's it's long nick will post it in the comments um post it in the episode description too um on on the freedomfight.us slash GE. Um, and so you can go there and we, I pre-wrote up a letter for you guys that I wrote. Um, you can just fill in your name and send them a copy of that. You can edit it to whatever you want to do and, and just go ahead and send them that letter telling them that you don't agree with their policy for this reason. And um, you're sticking up for the employees because here's what happens, right? We've been reached out to, to a lot of employees of GE, a lot of them. I think um, Nick, I think you made a statement to me, or maybe it was my wife, was shocked by the amount of GE employees that actually follow our page. Because um, <laughs> we start getting all these messages about them. And so they cannot speak up. You can't, if, if, if you're somebody who works on these things, you know you can't speak up. And I know there's a lot of other people like GE, but what we're trying to do is get GE to change their policy. If we can get GE to change their policy, we can go ahead and get a couple other people to change their policy using pressures. Now, I hear a lot of the detractors coming out being like, oh, I thought you were about liberty and free choice. I am about liberty and free choice. What's that mean? It means I don't want my government to tell GE what they have to do, right? I don't want that. I want to use the powers of society, the powers of social uh, of agreements, the powers of the free market to get GE to change their mind. And, and a lot of people out there are like, oh, it's illegal and all these other things and we should do law cases. I don't like that idea because as we've learned through COVID, if we open up that door of getting government involved in a situation, it can't go the other way. So basically what we're saying is, is if we say government can mandate that a, a company doesn't make their staff or doesn't make their, their employees get vaccinated or doesn't make their employees uh, uh, wear mass indicators and things like that, 
in a way, what we're saying is, is that it was government's place to legislate it in the first place, and government can in turn enforce it the other direction. Um, that would be of concern of getting government involved. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this. We're going we're gonna to see if we can so socially pressure them into it. And I know a lot of people will be like, hey. You know, that won't work. You guys are stupid. Well, maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. I like it better than, like I said, going to the government and asking them to solve my problems. I like proving that the free market can work. And also, too, we've seen this be very effective. I mean, let's call it space bait. This is the game plan the left does. They get a couple hundred or thousand people to comment and throw fit at some giant corporation and, and get them to change their policies. We're going to do the same thing, but we're going to do it for the actual staff inside that can't speak up for themselves. So that is um, GE um, um, sending them emails to let them know that we are none too happy. So there you go. Moving on from that here, what's next here? Um, we've got the, the Fayette County Public Schools are out of money. Please, guys, though, take this moment, hit the share button. Um, let everybody know you're watching. Um, share me in many places. Let everybody know we're over here doing, doing the hard, hard work. I'm over here. I am. I am. I am doped up. I am on pain pills to help with, with the pain of the kidney stones. Um, you guys can go ahead and, and hit that share button for me to reward me for the hard, hard work that I'm currently uh, putting in. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hit that share button. So uh, going back into it here. Um, so Fayette County Public Schools uh, has decided they're out of money. Now they're out of money. Um, they're blaming their CFO. They fired their CFO. But let me let me put this in perspective. Fayette County Public Schools normally receives rate right around about fifteen thousand five hundred a year per student. Last year, without the kids being in session at all, they got extra. They got an extra about twenty eight hundred. So they're doing about seventeen thousand eight hundred to about eighteen thousand. So about eighteen thousand dollars per student. Fayette County Public School, and somehow they have no money. They somehow have no money. It makes absolutely zero sense at all, but they somehow have no money. They've decided they're going to fire their CFO. Their CFO the other day at this press conference was like, yeah, I got a lot to say, but I'm not going to say it now, but I'm going to say it, you know, because <laughs> like they're like, I'm not getting sold down the river on this one. Um, it, it is quite frankly flabbergasting and it's troubling for a lot of reasons. Let me, let me put it in perspective how much money seven, eighteen thousand dollars a year is, uh, according to the USDA. Okay. So USDA, uh, dot, dot org there or dot gov, sorry. Um, says that the average cost to, to raise a child in America, to raise a child in America is right around, sorry, according to the USDA, uh, um, right around about seventeen thousand dollars a year on the high side, thirteen to fourteen thousand is the average. So thirteen to fourteen thousand dollars a year is how much it costs per year for you to raise your children. And Fayette County Public Schools can't educate them for eighteen thousand dollars a year. They're not even paying for their meals, guys. Keep that in mind. I mean, if they're on free or reduced lunch, it's a government grant paying for that. Otherwise, you're paying for their meal while they're at school. They only have them like eight months out of the year, eight hours a day. They don't provide a roof over their head. They don't provide them food. They don't, you know, like they don't provide them health insurance. And yet you're able to raise your child for less than the school spends per your child to educate them. And yet somehow they're out of money. Let me also put this in perspective how expensive that is. According to private schools, I believe it's called privateschools.com or whatever, privateschoolranker.com. Of the 80, there's 80, what was there, 86 private schools in Kentucky. With the one with the highest amount of, of tuition a year was $25,000 a year. That's the highest amount. That's the highest. 
The average private school in Kentucky costs right around $8,000 a year. Almost $10,000 less than your schools are spending per student. Public schools spend as much per student, more per student, cost more per student than all of the private schools other than the top six highest. So if you're ranking cost of schools and you had 83 private schools plus the public school, public school would fall into the fifth, sixth most expensive school. Do you feel like you're getting what you're paying for? So more importantly, where'd this money go? Well, one of the things they're citing is all their building construction. Well, you know, cost of building construction, uh, we need to add on 13% cost onto um, this, this cost of construction. Which keep in mind, this construction already, didn't this construction already start, Nick, before, um, before the pandemic hit? It started well before the pandemic hit. Um, and on top of that, they're adding on 13%. Real quick, let me look here. Um, cost of construction has so far raised, it looks like 8%, 9%. So they're tacking on another 3% there. I, I don't, I don't understand what they're spending their money on, you know, and what's more concerning here is correct me if I'm wrong. Don't, don't the public schools, they don't require it. Um, and I was about to say maybe they should, but I, I don't think they should be teaching it. Don't they require financial budgeting class? Don't they have them? Don't they offer them? I mean, is that who you want teaching your kids how to budget their money? <laughs> I mean, do you see what I'm saying there? Like, is that really who you want teaching your children, um, you know, to how to budget their money? Is, is somebody who spends more money than you do to crappily, crappily, uh, a lot of times educate your children that then lose millions, can't figure out how to make it work when they get millions in from the federal government extra. And then on top of that, they're coming back and saying, oh, we need more money. And of course, we all know, what are they setting up for? Well, they're simply setting up for a simple uh, a price raise. They're going to go ahead and they're going to raise those prices. So, you know, I guess that's just part of it now. That's just what uh, they do. That's just what they do. So, but there's Fayette County Public Schools there. Now moving on, other school story here. We have um, BR 119, uh, sex education bill. And so this is a pre-filed bill. It's a pre-filed bill to replace this current bill. Nick, can you go ahead? Let's throw up the what the current bill says. This is the current sex education law for schools in Kentucky. Let's see. No, not that one. No, do you have the original bill? No, no, no. There's an original uh, bill. I sent you a link for the original bill, but that's okay. So the original bill that it's replacing is approximately uh, five paragraphs long. Um, it is um, not a very long bill. It provides a lot of the, the free choices um, for schools to choose. So one thing you got to understand is there's something called a, a school council um, uh, at each school, which is comprised of parents. Like I think it's like two parents, two teachers, and the principal, or three parents, two teachers, and print, something like that. But there's a school council. They ultimately are the people who are in charge of setting the curriculum for a school. They have a lot more say so over the curriculum of the school than a lot of other people do. Um, but, but at the same time, um, at the same time, uh, you have the districts too that set curriculum and you have very, so when you have a loose law, what it does is it allows these districts as we just saw, um, I forget which district, but some district just banned CRT here in Kentucky. Um, but you know, when you, when you have these districts, they can choose to kind of do a, a lot of what they, you know, what do they, what do they want to do here? Right. And so the current law is, is a pretty short law. Um, it's only a few lines long here. It says, this is the current sex education law. There we go. Um, it says it's 158.1415. 4, 
Um, curriculum for instruction on human sexuality or sexually transmitted diseases. If a school council or if none exists, the principal that goes to that school council I was talking about adopts a curriculum for human sexuality or sexually transmitted diseases. Instruction shall include but not limited to the following content. Absence from sexual activity is a desirable goal for school-aged children. Absence from sexual activity is the only certain way to avoid unintended pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, and other associated health problems. And the best way to avoid sexually transmitted diseases and other associates health problems is to establish a permanent, mutually faithful, monogamous relationship. Now, in there, do they say anything about LGBTQ at all? Do they say you can't teach it? Do they say you can't teach it? No, they don't say anything. So a, a school can adopt a lot of curriculums that they want to. However, what these four Democrats out of Louisville have decided is that that's not good enough. And they have decided to pre-file an eight-page bill called BR-119 that does a lot of things. And it is a monstrosity bill that we're going to go through and talk about what they're trying to do. But first, one of the things I want you guys to remember as we're going through this bill is that this one of the one of the things the left does a lot of times is they pull this switcheroo, right? They try to convince you that this is a settled issue. But the fact of the matter is, is that religions are not, this is not a settled issue. Sexuality, gender, those things, they're not a settled issue. It's an issue very much for debate. And whether you like it or not, it is a religious rights issue. Here's why. Almost every single religion has to do with the creation of life. Therefore, you know, the creation, you know, how the world came to be. They all have their origin story, their creation story. Every religion does. And so they all have this creation story. And a lot of them have a defined, a defined um, relationship and, and sexual behaviors that are permissible or not permissible by the religion. Why is this? Well, it makes a lot of sense. Religions are built around the idea of forming life. Of course, the main, the main reason why sex exists in the first place is for procreation. That is, that is the functionality of sex. That's what it's supposed to do. Procreate, right? I know, like I said, I know we all have varying degrees of who we go home with, and, and that is your business. But that is the main point of sex. So we can't have this conversation without acknowledging that A, Relig there are people are religious. B, this is not a settled issue. C, that religions have opinions on these issues, and that you you get to decide. You should get to decide what goes on for your kids. So let's talk about what they want mandated to be taught to your children. <clears throat> Starting off here, characteristics of an uh, char characteristics. Sorry, of an effective program means. The aspects of evidence-based programs, including developmental content and implementation programs such that have been shown to be effective in the terms of increasing knowledge, clarifying values and attitudes, increasing skills, and impact behavior, and are widely recognized by leading medical and public health agencies to be effective in changing behaviors that lead to sexually transmitted infections, unintended pregnancies, dating violence, and sexual assaults among young people. Now, they're going to use that term a lot about um, public health agencies and leading medical and public health agencies. Here's the problem, right? Who elects? So let's go into the health department is considered one of these leading public health things. They actually have entire groups of people that teach sex health over at the health department. And who are they elected by? Who are they accountable to? As many of you realize off of a post we made there the other day, is the health department is its own quasi-independent body that is ran by a board that is not voted on by the voters. In fact, one of the only people who are guaranteed to be on the board is the mayor or a person from the mayor's office, but they're a non-voting member. As far as I read the statutes about how health departments work, they were formed one day as a board, and the board votes on who's on the board and off the board and everything else and votes on who's chair of the board. They're unaccountable to anybody but themselves or the written laws, but they're unaccountable. So if they decide what is effective and they come up with a decision that is different than what you believe, you now have government bureaucrats deciding what should be taught to your children when it comes to sensitive, up-for-debate issues such as religious issues. And like I said, I don't care who you go home with, but this is about 
everybody should have the freedom of religion and the freedom to raise their children as they see fit. And if they don't believe in their children being around these things or they disagree with the timeline of it, then that is their right and their ability to do. It is not the state's job to raise children. That is the parent's job to raise children. But that's not the worst part of the bill. That's just something I want to set you up. Let's go here to the next section of, of more things here. <clears throat> Healthy relationship instruction means instruction as part of a comprehensive school health education approach, which addresses the physical, mental, emotional, and social dimensions of human relationships and is designed to motivate and assist students to maintain and improve healthy relationships, prevent disease, reduce and reduce sexual health related risk behaviors. And next section. And. Culturally appropriate means materials and instructions that respond to culturally diverse individuals, families, and communities in an inclusive, respectful, and effective manner and includes materials and instructions that are inclusive of race, ethnicity, languages, cultural backgrounds, religions, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, and different abilities. That's interesting. That's culturally appropriate. What they mean by culturally appropriate. The problem is these things disagree. For example... If my religion disagrees with gender identity, like, for example, as we know, there's a lot of uh, uh, certain Muslim countries that adhere to a certain amount of religious Muslim law where they believe in throwing homosexuals off buildings. So if that's an individual's religion, though, but then you also have to be inclusive of something else, that seems conflicting. But once again, that's playing that game of pretending all these things agree and they don't. But let's continue to the next part here. Gender expression. <clears throat> gender expression means the expression of one's gender, including expression through behavior, clothing, hair, or voice, which may or may not conform in socially defined behaviors and characteristics typically associated with being masculine or feminine. Gender identity means the gender-related identity, appearance, mannerisms, and other gender-related characteristics of an individual, regardless of an individual's designated sex at birth, and shall include a person's deeply held sense or knowledge of their own gender as male, female, both, or neither. This is interesting, and I want you to remember these lines. Not only one is it quite clear they're coming out and saying, "Listen, you know, we're going into, uh, uh, we, you know, we we are going to mandate your children be taught." gender identity and gender expression, right? We're not going to leave it up to the schools to decide. We're not going to leave it up to the councils of the schools. No, we're going to make it a state law that your children have to be taught about gender expression and gender identity. And it's going to be taught based upon how whatever bureaucrat that is your leading health expert decides. But also, I want you to remember these lines. Because it conflicts with another part of this bill we're going to talk about here in a second. So about what they mean when they say inclusive. In inclusive term here. <clears throat> inclusive. Means curriculum that ensures that a student from historically marginalized communities see themselves reflected in classroom materials and lessons, including but not limited to communities of color, immigrant, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender communities, people with disabilities, and others who've experienced traditionally left out of health education programs and policies. Inclusive. So they have to show it once again. So anytime in this law where they say we need to show inclusive material, they're saying that no matter what, it has to have these things in there. Medically accurate and complete means a program of instruction that contains information that has been verified or supported by the weight of research conducted in compliance and scientific method, plus in peer review articles, or leading professional public health or medical organizations. Once again, once again, that's medically accurate and complete. Once again, we're handing that off to these bureaucrats to decide how this all works. And how how it all how it all how it all does, and as we've seen, the problem with that, as we've seen out in places like California, is that their version of inclusive means not inclusive of your viewpoint, 
but inclusive of their viewpoint. Meaning their viewpoint is all viewpoints matter other than one that disagrees with them. Which is important to understand what they mean by inclusive. Remember, guys, this is a law. They want to mandate this. But who do they want to teach this to? So you're like, well, Andrew, you know, it's not a big deal if my 16-year-old kid, 17-year-old kid gets taught about gay, bisexual, homosexual things. That doesn't matter as much to me because, well, Andrew, they're, they're an adult. They're a kid, right? They're, 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 they're going to be adult. They probably know about it. You know, it's all out there. It's on the TVs and stuff. It doesn't matter. Well, let, let's see who they want this to be taught to. <clears throat> Beginning in the 2023 to 2024 school year, each district shall provide healthy relationship instruction to all public school students in kindergarten through grade 12. This law applies to all grades. Had to be taught healthy relationship instruction. And you say, well, this is kind of worrisome. Not only is it worrisome, but it involves some interesting um, um, other rules in here too as well. So remember when I said earlier on, where it said it didn't want to teach about harmful gender. It, it, I'm sorry, it didn't want, it wanted people when it comes to um, um, people's gender roles. It didn't want to teach, uh, it, it, it said when people present as male or female, that is because they're presenting as they are within those gender roles. Well, um, here though, in, in line four, page four, line, sorry, line seven, it says, examining, examining the harm of gender role stereotypes, violence, coercion, bullying, and intimidation relationships, and exploring the way that gender stereotypes can limit all people. Examples of varying types of relationships, couples and family structures, discussion of healthy relationships shall include aff affirmative representation of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals' relationships and families. Affirmative representation. So they early on, they say, hey, we don't want you teaching about dangerous um, or no, we, we want you to teach that people can present differently and as male or female or both because they're presenting themselves because they feel they fit a gender stereotype better. Right. I mean, that's what it is. Right. When you when you're saying because because if gender stereotypes either exist or they don't. And of course, I naturally believe gender stereotypes typically exist. You'd have to be a fool to think they don't. But, you know, whatever. They exist. I'm not saying that should limit you, right? Just because you're a woman doesn't mean this. But it does mean if we're looking at things on a bell curve, there is a vast majority of, of for an example, um, because of whatever reason, a majority of women go into nursing over men. Okay? So if you look at nursing in the bell curve, there's more women in it than men probably has something to do with their gender roles, I would think, but what do I know? But more importantly, you, you can't though talk about the gender roles because that's a dangerous stereotype. So how do you talk to a person that says, well, I believe I'm a woman because I like Barbie dolls or a kid that says, I believe I'm a girl because I like Barbie dolls. Well, that's a gender stereotype that girls like Barbie dolls. But at the same time, at the same time, you they're saying I'm a girl because of this gender stereotype. It doesn't mess you, it doesn't make sense. Like, is this making sense to you at all? The bill doesn't make any sense. I do encourage people to read it. The whole bill doesn't make sense. And and on top of that, here, I mean, go, going into it here too, as well. Um this, this, is, this is another line that is very uh, alarming to us here. A school district shall not restrict the ability of an instructor to answer a question initiated by a student that is related to and consistent with this section. However, a school also shall establish a procedure for a parent or legal guardian to submit a signed statement to excuse a student from the instruction required by subsection 2 of this section without disciplinary, academic, or any penalty. So. So, and it's, and I'm sorry, the materials for this course is only available upon a request. So a parent has to A, 
ask for this material to be given to them. The school is under no requirement to tell a parent, this is what we're going to teach your child. Then on top of that, you have to sign a written statement. However, when you look at line five there, and it says a school or school district shall not restrict the ability of a structure to answer a question initiated by a student. And remember, this bill applies to all kids between K and 12. So, under this law, legally speaking, if your kid goes to public school and they're in second grade or kindergarten and they walk up to the teacher and they heard a word, they heard the word sex, and they ask a teacher what sex is, the teacher legally is able to answer and it cannot be a policy and the school district cannot get upset at them. The parent cannot ask the school district to punish them if they then sit that kid down in kindergarten and explain everything what sex is. Robbing the parent of the ability to frame and have that conversation based upon what their beliefs are. Some of you may be like, well, you know, most beliefs this, that. no, it doesn't matter. There's religions out there. Take, for example, um, Waco, the branch, the branch uh, Davidians. They didn't believe in having sex. In fact, their leader believed in having sex with all the women so the men weren't burdened with the sin of having to have sex. But <laughs> more importantly, their religion did not believe in having sex. So if a kid walks up and says, what is sex? And, 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 their, and their parent is a member of that sect of religion, Branch Davidian. And their religion doesn't believe in having sex. That teacher has now squashed all over their religious rights. And you can be like, well, that's an extreme example. And I don't think that. Those, those people who believe that should be able to like think that way, and that's damaging to the kid. That may be, but who are you? Who are you to decide what is religiously okay and not okay? I may think a lot of religions are different or weird or odd, or I disagree with them. You know, I may think, I may think, I find Taoism to be an interesting religion. Okay. I, I, I think I, I don't understand parts of it. This idea that things happen that happen and there's not really a God and things like that. I personally, maybe I don't agree with that. I, I, I certainly don't agree with atheists, right? I believe there's a God and a creator, right? Who am I though to legislate my religious beliefs on another person? Who am I to do that? But yet that's what these, these inclusive caring Democrats are mandating that schools do to your children is completely ignore everything to do with your religious freedoms when it comes to your children. On top of that, even if you do write them a letter, they said you got to adopt a pro uh, a, adopt a policy prohibiting the student from being excused from the instruction required by subsection two of this without a signed statement submitted by parent or guardian pursuant to a policy established in paragraph B. What that means is, is that let's say your kid is a 16-year-old conservative kid. He grew up in your conservative household. He's a conservative kid. And the teacher goes, all right, I'm going to have you do a worksheet on what your gender identity is. Or I'm going to do a worksheet on, on what, what are you? He says, I'm a guy. It's like, are you sure? Without a signed written statement, the kid is unable to excuse himself out of that conversation. But even in the event you give them a signed written statement, according to section B, it says in the event a parent or guardian submitting a signed statement to excuse a student from instruction required by section two, subsection two of this section, a school is encouraged to provide that student an alternate assignment on a related topic during the instructional time. During the instructional time. Related topic. So if we're instructing people on what their gender identity is at the time, and I say I don't want my kid in that class, this law makes it seem like they can now legally provide 
your kid now worksheet on what their gender identity is rather than sitting in the class. That doesn't sound like you can opt out of it at all, can you? And let's keep in mind, too, you got to understand on how these laws are wrote. They're wrote purposefully to be a little open-ended at times. To be a little open-ended at times. To leave it up for the discretion of the courts. And to leave it open for the arguments to be made. And you can tell that they want to pass this law to create court cases to shove down their sexual ideologies onto your families when you go to here to the last section here, section 10, that says a parent or guardian with a child enrolled in public school that fails to comply with the requirement of this section may file circuit court action to enforce provisions of this section within one year from the date of the last school day, the academic year. Act may be besides the Education for Healthy Youth Act. Healthy Youth Act. Meaning that a, a, a parent or guardian of any child can sue the school. So if you have one lefty activist parent that's really upset that their child, their, their fifth grader, was taught uh, about the male and female anatomies and got upset that it wasn't inclusive enough to gender roles and identities and the idea of, of transgenderism and all these other uh, isms, they can sue the school and force their viewpoints on this onto everybody else in that district. That is concerning. Because at the end of the day, I personally do not care who someone goes home with because it doesn't affect my life. And at the end of the day, that's what it's about. You should be able to go through life and exist with your beliefs without affecting other people. And if that individual there doesn't want their kid taught that men can be women and women can be men and men and women don't exist and gender stereotypes aren't real but are real and there's, there's uh, genders on a spectrum and there's 90 of them, if that's what they want their kid to be taught, then they can teach their kid that. If I don't want my kid to be taught that, then I can't, I don't want my kid taught that. And we are not affecting each other in life. But of course, that's not how the totalitarian over here wants it. They say it is a, it is abusive and it is terrible that you would ever disagree with me on how you should raise your child. And I'm going to take you to courts and force you to do it. Because how dare you have a different opinion than me based upon thousands of years of your religion and traditions. It's totalitarian. And it's ridiculous. Does this bill going to really go anywhere? Probably not. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you guys. It probably doesn't go a whole lot of places. This is a Republican-controlled House and Senate. But it does show you the fact that they'd file it. They are standing loud and proud to say, this is what we stand for. This is what we want your children to be taught. And it's concerning. It is certainly concerning. And to play off that too, we have this here, just interesting video coming out of, uh, out of a school district there, um, Justice School District in Virginia. Yeah, can we go ahead and play that video? With human greed, racism, extreme versions of individualism and capitalism, white supremacy, growing wealth gaps, disease, climate crisis, extreme poverty amidst luxury and waste right next door. And the list goes on. So what did she just say there? Well, one of the things she just said uh, was remember your jihad. That's uh, one of the things she'd said there in Arabic. She said, remember your jihad. Um, let's go over who this person is. This individual, um, her father, 10 years prior, was suspended out of this school, fired from the school for saying the same thing, telling Muslim children to remember their jihad. He is a, I, I believe, the equivalent of like a deacon at the local um, mosque there. Um, that mosque that he is a deacon at is the same mosque that two of the 9-11 hijackers went to pretty it seems like an extreme circle to run in but here we have a school board member giving a commencement speech telling 
kids to remember their jihad. Once again, let's remember that we can all exist in this country as long as we are not infringing on each other's rights, freedoms, as long as we are not affecting each other. But when you stand up there and you tell my child to remember their jihad, you're now once again pushing your views using your place of trust as a, a teacher in the district to push down your views. And that's disgusting and that's not cool. That's not really allowed. Um, moving on here, though, Biden goes to Europe. Biden goes to Europe here. Um, does he go to Europe? I don't know. We've got a couple clips here. You just want to play all three of them real quick there. What do you say to Vladimir Putin? <laughs> the answer to the first question, <laughs> I'm laughing too. Actually, I... Well, look, I mean, he has made clear that uh, uh, the answer is, I believe he has in the past essentially acknowledged that he was, uh, or certain things that he would do or did do. But look, um, when I was asked that question, on air, I answered it honestly. Yeah, playing back, back. But it's not much of a. I, 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 I don't think it matters a whole lot in terms of this next meeting we're about to have. The, the second question was really. Be, Yeah, I mean that was a full like six, seven second pause, like it, like an uncomfortable amount of silence where you're like, "What?" And then in the in the last one there, he's playing with like a walkie talkie on his thing. The other day, his his wife was giving a speech. He had to be told to pay attention. Apparently, while he was in Europe, he wandered into like some cafe, and like he wasn't even supposed to be there. And like his handlers like came up, was like, "Joe, come out." You know, like he just like wandered off somewhere, you know, and so th the point is, is that um, this is the guy who's over there and, and he's he's over there really representing America and showing we've got a backbone and America's back, baby. You keep hearing people say that. people are so glad to have America back on the stage. First off, I'll tell you what the Europeans are very happy with. They're happy with the fact we're giving them crap tons of money. Right. I mean, let's keep in mind. Oop, I just dropped you guys. Do you see that? Um, let's keep in mind, <laughs> um, let's keep in mind that, um, what, what they're really upset about or having issues with here is that we didn't, weren't giving them money before. I mean, they, they, they liked us giving them money before. And one of the things Trump cut off to them was, and he came out and said it, right? He said, I'm not going to keep giving you guys money. You guys are not pulling your weight. He came out and said that. And what they're they're like, oh, we're so happy to have a partner back on the stage. No, you're so happy to get tax paying dollars. I mean, look at this national, this or this 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 worldwide um tax. Okay. Um, have, have I don't know if anybody's really dug into it. I kind of took a look at it. How it's wrote, how this, how this worldwide 15% corporate tax is wrote, it's wrote in such a way that most of so so how it works is you're generally taxed. In the country you do business in. So right now, revenues that like Facebook generates in England, actually America gets to tax, right? However, how this is wrote now is you say, well, you know, they say, well, the countries that um, will not will be taxed where they're making the revenue at. So if Facebook makes a couple billion dollars in, in, in UK, then they get taxed by UK, right? And you say, well, that's okay. We're losing out our revenue on our companies based here. But you know, there's a lot of companies based overseas. So um, then, they're, then you know, we're going to collect up those tax revenues, right? Because we're a big market. We're the third largest country. So clearly, these other companies are doing a lot of business here. Well, special interests at work. Apparently, the limitations are such that it almost is exclusively American countries because I think they set the limit at something like companies that make more than $20 billion a year 
And that's like all American com companies, specifically tech companies um, that are all based here in America. And then, um, you know, they're carving out exemptions for some of these industries where they do go over that amount, but they're not tech. Basically, they're just trying to ta tax uh, the American tech, com tech companies. They're doing business over there that on tax dollars that normally America would get. So it's essentially giving more tax dollars out of, out of the American countries into these, uh, and into these G seven countries. And so it's, it's obvious, um, that, that, you know, I'd be happy about that deal too, if I'm England, especially after Brexit, like, yeah, give me some more revenue. Right. Um, but anyway, so, you know, they're happy about that. They're happy about, I mean, like this VAX program where they're like, okay, the G seven countries have come together and pledged a billion vaccines to help get the world vaccinated, right? Half of those are coming from America. There's six other countries splitting up the other 500 billion. Yeah, I would take that deal too. They're just happy that America's back pulling all the weight and paying up all the money that Trump was not on board with doing. And that's what they mean by they're so happy to have a partner back. They're just happy to have our money back. And they don't care. I mean, look at Boris Johnson. He was trolling Biden like crazy. Um, this is this is real funny. So there's this bike. OK, so so, Nick, you've got some details on this bike. T tell us about this bike that um, Joe Biden uh, gave to to Boris Johnson, the, 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 the UK prime minister was gifted a bike. Do you have those details there, Nick? Oh, okay. Nick can't hear. I didn't know you guys can't hear Nick. Okay. So there's this bike. Okay. Um, that he gave to him and it is a, a $5,000 bike. Do we have a picture of the bike? Let's throw that picture up there. It's, it's a picture of this bike here. Um, it is. It is. It was a five thousand dollar bike that is handmade in Boston. It normally takes around a year and a half to make this bike, but they gave the bike maker like four weeks' notice, and they got it for a discount too. Apparently, the State Department only spent like two grand on it. So a lot of times, if you see the story posted, you'll see a fact check that says the State Department only spent two grand on it because they'll say Biden gave Boris Johnson a, a five six thousand dollar bike and a helmet that has the British Union Jack and the American flag on it. And what did Boris Johnson give Joe Biden? Well, he gave Joe Biden a printed out picture from Wikipedia of Booker T. Washington framed. <laughs> he printed out a picture from Wikipedia and framed it and gave that to Joe Biden as his gift. It's kind of like a last minute gift where like Joe Biden shows up, hands him a bike and he's like, oh man, we were supposed to do a gift exchange? Quick, turns to an aide, like, quick, go, go find something. Go find, you know, he, he likes, I don't know, he likes racism and things. Go find somebody who fought racism and, 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 and make him a picture from it. It seems like a last minute gift for picking up, like, you know, I'm going through the airport and I saw like a nice picture frame and I went over to the business center and I printed out a picture for you because I forgot to get you anything. It just seems like that. And it's hilarious and it's funny. And that is the perfect allegory allegory is that the word for a, a story that is drawing a, a a conclusion there anyways an allegory allegorical situation for exactly what our relationship is like with the rest of the countries of the world we get them a seven thousand dollar bike they give us a printed out picture of booker t washington well, guys, that's all I have time for. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I know this podcast probably is a little different, a little weird. Maybe audio was funky, but I thank you guys for joining us. Regardless, have a great day.